Well, so thank you for being here. Uh, that was the introduction. And now let me start with why I call this the seven stages of unit testing. Because I consider it somehow similar to the seven stages of mourning, uh, the death of somebody. And I will go into detail now, but let me start this properly. Zveiki. And. <laughs> Cape Sekasi, is that right? So thank you for being here at you. And today we're going to talk about uh, unit testing, how it is good, why is it good, why it's worth for you to spend the time on writing unit testing. And uh, if you all have already been taught about how to write unit tests, at least we will have a little bit of discussion uh, about how uh, it's going to be, you can improve it and it's going to be useful to you. But if you haven't, I will do a very uh, brief live coding session uh, showing the very basics of the unit tests that you can write for a, an object-oriented application. And well, let's start with the first stage. And the first stage is usually shock and disbelief. And by that, I mean that probably you have asked yourself, I mean, come on, I write awesome code why do I need to write code again to test and to prove that that is right? Well, the thing is, I would suggest you to take it as a selfish exercise. Uh, don't do it for others, do it for yourself. And instead of having discussions with your colleagues, with your team, you will have the proof to them that your code is right and not your intuition. Uh, the second thing that is very important is how, what, what, what does my code apply properly? I mean, why is it right for this uh, scenario and not right for these others? And all these assumptions and all these contracts are defined in the tests. Not only that, I would say that all the documentation that you have in your test is the documentation that you need. And this is the documentation that we as developers are happier writing because let's, let's be honest, I don't think you'll enjoy writing this HTML or these comments inside of your code that is translated into some uh, documentation for the rest of the world. One more thing that you will get from unit tests is uh, the ability to catch other people when they introduce codes. Uh, sorry, when they introduce bugs in your code, because here you know that it is not you, but anybody else who introduces the bugs. And in order to catch them on time, to know why uh, they are doing something wrong, if they run the test while they are doing their code, you will see how uh, they are failing. And it will be also easier for them to refactor your code and also for you. The deadlines is something that worries very much to the developers because you have a deadline, you have to have everything ready by next Friday uh, because it's the end of the spring or any other reason. And people is worried about the time that they devote to write unit tests. And, but I think that it is easier to do a good estimation on how long you are going to spend writing unit tests rather than how long you are going to spend in the debugger. I don't know about you, but every time I get into the debugger, I know when I get in, I never know when I'm going to get out. And well, also it is important for people who are doing freelancing or are working for uh, agencies or consulting companies because you would like to be able to reuse your code, to create code once that can be used for more than one product. And let me remind you that reusable code is the one that comes not only with the code, but with the tests that prove that the code can be applied in that new scenario. The idea behind unit tests is to prove the public interface of your code. And that is why it's so important. Not the private, the details, but the public interface. And what it makes them more useful is that I know that you are testing all the time when you are writing your applications and you are running the device uh, on the device, whatever you are writing in code. But let's be honest, you don't test the code that you wrote yesterday or one month ago. And if you have tests for those, then they are checked at the same time. Some people are worried when they found out that this is a good uh, opportunity to introduce tests and to have a, a safety network. Uh, where do I start and 
what happens if I don't have fully tested my application? Well, the idea here is not to have it fully tested, although that would be uh, good, or at least a high percentage of it, but uh, you can add unit tests on the go. I mean, like when, while you're writing new code, it's a good occasion to introduce a new unit test. If you don't know where to start, the model is usually the right place to do it. It is easier to test than the views or any other more complex parts like the network or the access to the remote APIs or anything like that. It is uh, easier always to test the, the model. And if you think that you are trying to test it and it is not clear to you how to address this test, I would remind you to use the uh, solid principles and particularly the single responsibility principle to get rid of these uh, problems because they it will help you a lot. If you are not there yet, at least I would recommend you to start with the bugs. When somebody reports a bug in your application, you can uh, write some unit tests to prove first that it is failing, then you fix it and now it is fixed forever. You cannot reintroduce the bug later for, by mistake. Uh, second stage would be denial. And by denial, I mean, uh, okay, you have accepted that you should write some tests, but then you figure out that, well, it takes a while to write it. And I don't know about you, but when I first, uh, when I did my first omelet, it was a total disaster. It took me forever, it was not tasty. But after a while, you get practice and your omelets are better. I would even say they are good and it takes you no time to do them. Same thing happens with unit tests. They are as tasty as omelets. And as I said before, it is easier to do an estimation on how much time you are going to spend writing them than debugging. So the good news and the bad news are that everything that you need is included in your default uh, environment. If you're using Android, you will probably be using Android Studio. Can, can I have some hands up here? Android Studio? The rest of you are using Eclipse or is it just a mistake? Are you in the right room? Yes, okay. So uh, if you're using Android Studio, you already have everything you need in order to run unit tests. And the projects already come with a source set that allows you to introduce new classes for the unit tests and a very, very crappy example. You can disregard that one uh, and create your own classes. I would recommend you to use shortcuts because what you want to have is uh, muscle memory to run the test as often as possible uh, instead of going to the unit tests and play them. That is a bad idea. So using control R with the right configuration will be really helpful, really helpful. And you can start by using JUnit. That is, if I remember this correctly, is already included in the default dependencies of your project. Uh, there are many other things that you can use, but with this one, you can go a long way. Third stage will be anger. And anger comes from the problem of writing the unit test. So let me make a very, this is freaking by the way, I don't know what you were thinking, but uh, uh, what I would recommend you to do is to follow the rules for writing good unit tests. Don't ever write a unit test for somebody else's code. And by that, I mean, don't write any unit test for Google's code or some library that you have uh, been using as a dependency in your application. Uh, only one level of abstraction, and by that I mean write your code properly. Don't be like uh, small kids that tell you the story of the movie and start by tiny details instead of the uh, plot of the movie. And so your code should be readable by going function to function, and you need more detail in one piece, then you make another function and you move to their the detail. And it's only the higher level, the public functions with the one level of abstraction, the ones that you're going to address in the unit test. Only test the, the public methods. It's a, one, a very common uh, question in Stack Overflow. How do I test private methods? Yes, don't, okay? And uh, usually, and notice that there is a star here at the end, one assertion per test. The idea is that if you run your test in any order, they should work properly, that the results should be the same, and there should be no state other than the one that you declare in the beginning of the test, in the setup, 
and that is actually destroyed by the end of the test. Uh, I would say that there are three types of unit tests. They have other, number, other names in some other sources, but I usually use this, the return value. You invoke a method of one of your uh, classes, and this method returns something. You have set up the environment. After invoking the method, you verify that the return value is what you were expecting pretty easy. Second one is you test state. And when you want to test state, uh, you invoke a method, the one that you want to test, and the properties, some properties, some public properties of your object change. And you verify that at the end of the test. Finally, uh, you have to test behavior, the interaction of your objects with any other object. And I would say that these are the most, uh, more common ones. Um, average about 70% uh, behavior, 20% state, 10% return value and without yeah sorry uh, without any further detail let me go to the uh, to the Xcode and let's write some code here uh, feel free to make any comments tell me if, I, if it's not clear what I'm going to do is I have created this project that is called the testable me like the despackable me and this uh, is a an application that is going to make me rich because it's about bad, bad people and you know that uh, evil always brings more money than good so what we are going to do here is to create a, a new class sorry uh, that I'm going to call uh, supervillain and So, can, can everybody read this uh, at the back of the room? So this is going to be a data class. And as I said, it's going to be called Supervillian. It's going to have uh, a couple of properties and as such, Yes, I can. I can barely read it from here, so. In my case, it's the lights that are coming from me. So. Let me go here, which I think is going to be easier. Do you see that? Solarized dark. So let's make it solarized. La apply. Okay. Much better? Yeah, okay. So uh, let me switch the phone again because the other one was set for this room. This one is not. So. Much better? Can everybody read it? Okay, so these are the two properties. It has a first name, it has a last name. And since these are properties of the language, I'm not testing anything yet. I wouldn't have to test that when I set up a property, it stores the value of the property. That is one behavior that is tested in the language. What I'm going to do instead is to add some code here that is going to create in this case, a uh, computed property that is going to be the full name. That is uh, the concatenation of the first name and the space and the last name. Pretty easy, but I want to test that method, that computed property that behaves exactly the same as a function. So what I'm going to do here is to go to the supervillain, uh, create a new test, and using the template here, I'm not going to define anything other than uh, that it is J unit four, and here it comes the important part. Uh, notice that there are two places where you can put this test. The first one is for instrumentation, for the ones that will run Espresso or even Roboelectric if you want to, and the second one is meant for the logic test. I mean the the ones that don't require to run 
the emulator. So we're going to set this one because it's logic in the second one. And here I'm going to define the first uh, unit test. So, oh, sorry. I'm going to, let me do this properly. I'm going to create the test and uh, the test is going to be a J unit and is going to be not this one. It's going to be called uh, full name is first name space last name. And let me tell you, the name has to be descriptive because this is what you're going to read if the test fails. You don't want to go into the, the test to see what went wrong. You want the test to be self-describing. So uh, what I'm going to, this is because probably I chose the unit five by a mistake. Yeah. So let's make it, let's create this unit test and any unit test has uh, three parts. And I usually use this acronym, uh, the three A's, arrange, act and assert. By arrange, I mean you set up the environment as you want it, then you act, you use the method that you want to test, and then you assert. You say what you expect to have as a result of that, okay? So what we're going to do is go step by step through these uh, three parts of the test. The first one is create an object that we're going to test. And in order to do that, uh, so we are going to call this SUT. It stands for uh, system under test, the thing that we are testing. And the thing that we're going to test is the supervillian, not the supervillian test, but the supervillian. And notice that here we're going to have a first name and the first name is going to be Lex. And then we are going to have the last name and the na last name is going to be Luthor. So now we have a supervillian and we can go and execute the method that we want to test. The method that we want to test in this case is a computed property, exactly the same as a method. So what we do is uh, we use that computed property and we store the value in a, a constant here, okay, a full name. Finally, we're going to do the assertion and the assertion is going to be So, yeah, assert equals, and I'm going to write the value that I'm expecting first, and where do I expect to have it? So, I expect to have in full name, Lex space Luthor, the hard-coded value. So, if I go here now, and I run and I do this for the first time so it gets the configuration created automatically, I will have, hopefully, if I didn't make any mistake, a test pass. So, actually it will show two because it already had the example, the crappy one that I was mentioning before. And here we go. So full name has been tested properly. Okay, so Let's go with the second one. And for that, I need some new code in my supervillian. Uh, this one, I'm going to delete it. And I go here and I'm going to make the, the property not only readable, but uh, writable, writable. So, and by that, I mean that I'm going to define a setter that is going to be uh, Let's do this properly. So it's going to be the setter and I'm going to create that here again. Okay, let me tidy up this. So and what you have here is that if you receive a value in full name, it will split it and it will get the first name from the first word separated by spaces and the second uh, the last name from the second word i know that this can fail in so many different scenarios but for the basic one this should work and let's go and write the test and in order to write the test we create a new test and we call this test 
full name, sets, first name, and last name. Pretty readable, isn't it? So again, I go and define the th three parts of the test, and I will go and write the code here. So in order to create the, the supervillain, what I'm doing is exactly the same as I was doing before. Create a, a supervillain with the first name and the last name. In order to act, I'm going to do exactly the same thing as I was doing before. Exercise the method that I want to test. So in this case, this is going to be uh, suit full name equals Darth Vader. And here, what I'm going to assert is that the properties are the ones that I was expecting. So, sorry, not this one. I will assert that the first name is going to be Darth and that the last name is going to be Vader. Notice that I'm using two assertions, but this is because they are pointing to the same line in the code. So if something fails, I know what to fix. Okay, so if I run this, hopefully, again, we will have a second unit test passing. And that is the testing of state. Uh, so yeah, it is here. And finally, I would like to test behavior. And in order to do that, I'm going to create a new interface here uh, that I'm going to call... Oh, before that, sorry. One thing that I would like to do is reorganize the code. One thing that uh, you will notice here is that these tests are weak because they use legs, as, which I don't know how good you are at typing. I'm terrible, which means that's why I have snippets. And uh, in order to have good tests, you rather have something that is defined initially. Uh, if you're going to do this in every operation, you, you initialize everything at the beginning. So probably you want to have something here that is called the, the uh, before function. Uh, usually, uh, sorry, usually is the uh, setup. And this function uh, is going to contain the same suit that I was using before. So uh, let me move this up. Sometimes not here, here. So in my supervillain, I will have this before function. In order to have a property that is used in all the tests, I'm going to define that property here. So this is going to be um, a private late init var that I will use in order to set up all the tests. And what I'm going to do here is define this, the suit with the supervillain uh, constructor as I was doing exactly before. Okay, same thing. But now I can go and get rid of this and also I can get rid of this initialization here. So the arrange part doesn't exist anymore because it's done at the setup level. Hopefully this will run again and the test will pass again. Okay, now the second thing that I will do in order to improve this test is to create to use constants instead of using the actual strings, as I said before. So uh, what I'm doing here is not sorry. Even with snippets, you have to know what you're typing. So CTC. No. This is. Yeah, sorry. Ah, that was working because I didn't even uh, check that one. Okay, so this is the uh, CTC. What was that? Oh, that is here. And the constants are going to be here. Nope. Just a second. It's being cooked. Yeah. So I have the constants here. And in order to do that, I do the checking here with the actual constant. Okay. So that should make it. And that should pass. Let me create the interface. And uh, let's go here. And let's create a new interface that is going to be
this is going to be a mega weapon and it's going to be an interface you know that any mega weapon is anything that can be fired so what how does a supervillain use a mega weapon well a, a supervillain uses a mega weapon in order to attack and how does it do that uh, sorry It has an attack method, it gets a um, weapon, and it uses that to fire it. So how do we test that? Well, we go to the test, and we create a new test, which is going to be... We are going to call the, this test attack fires mega weapon and we are going to have also the same three parts in the arrange part uh, we already have the find the suit in the act part we are going to use the suit to attack but what weapon are we going to pass here and how do we do the assertion because this assertion is not over the object that we are testing but over the weapon that the weapon has been fired. So how do we do that? Well, we will we will need to have here an inner class that is going to be a test double. And let me find this. Oh, perfect. So this is the the class that I created as a, a test double. That is an implementation of Mega Weapon. It it says when it is fired because it has a boolean flag, and when the fire method is invoked, it changes that from false to true. So uh, what I'm going to do in the test is to create a mega weapon. No, oh, sorry. To create an instance of the mega weapon, here we're going to say that the weapon is going to be the weapon mock. And what we're going to assert finally is. that the weapon mock is fired and that is the way to test behavior and with this I have demonstrated the three kinds of tests so let me finish the presentation the four stage is bargain and one of the things that you should worry about is how to make the things simpler and one thing that is important and I cannot go into a lot of detail here because of the lack of time is architecture but let me give you a small hint a uh, view is perfectly testable as long as you separate the view from uh, another layer which could be either the model view or the presenter. The important thing here is that the view is as dumb as possible. So it will send events to the next layer, to the view model, and it will uh, send, a, it will process either the structure that describes the view, which is the view model, or the messages that come from the presenter in order to update the view which are usually methods. So if you do that, the view is fully testable. The other thing that you will have as an advantage here is also that the second layer, the presenter or the view model, can easily be tested without having to create any view mock at all. You just have to create an, an interf implement the interface, the abstraction of the view, but not you don't have to create actual views in order to do the testing. Five stage. Well, guilt, and the guilt comes from uh, the lack of knowledge that people have normally about what a test double is. And a test double is not just a mock. Uh, there are two schools of TDD. The one that was uh, that was originated in Detroit, that was led by uh, Kenbeck, and that had the idea of starting from the smaller objects and building on top of that and then using the actual objects in order to create that. That was a bottom-up approach of this to, to design of software. And the other school, which I would say that is more uh, present nowadays, is the London school. And the London school was doing the, totally the opposite. The details is something that I can always implement later. So I will go with the higher le level of detail. I will create the top level classes. And for everything else that I need there, I will use a mock. And that is fairly useful because then you can create productive code very fast and then go into the details when you need them. So in order to do that, what you use is test doubles. And there are not only mocks, but a few behaviors of test doubles. 
The simplest one is the dummy. The dummy is the one that you need, for example, for a method or in order to invoke the constructor of an object, but it's not used in the logic of, the, of any of your tests. It is mostly passed to some of the class or something like that. So the dummy is just a skeleton that matches the type of object that you need there. That's it. The stub instead is uh, an object that you want to talk to, you want to ask that object for some information, and what you will get is the expected answer. So you are querying that you're using a method of that object, of that stub, and you can control the answer from that method. The third one is the spy, and the spy is like the nanny cams. I don't know if you have nanny cams here in Lithuania, but these are the cams that when you have kids, and you leave the kids at home with somebody that you don't fully trust, you leave some teddy bear or something like that with a camera in your eye, and when you go to the bar or to the restaurant, you can see what's happening at home. So Spy is something like that. Uh, what it's doing is uh, it's a class that is listening, similar to what we wrote before with the, uh, mo the Mega Weapon Mock, uh, is a class that is listening in the methods that you want, and it will tell you uh, if the method was invoked or not, what were the parameters that were used, and so on. The mock, the mock is what we usually call to this, all these things, but it actually has a little bit more of intelligence. The reason why we call this, uh, all of these objects mocks is because mocks are uh, what is the mocking libraries that we use, like Mockito, uh, are called mocking libraries. They are not called Damier libraries or stabbing libraries. But they also do stabbing, they also do spying, and they do mocking. So as I said, it has higher level of logic, but it does mostly the same thing as the spy and the stab together, or just one of it, if you want. And the fake is when you want to, to uh, use some uh, functionality inside of, uh, of your application, but this is not part of your test, and you want to simplify it. For example, you want to send a cipher message, but you, the ciphering is not the important part, not how it is ciphered, but the fact that it is ciphered. And in order to do that, or, or a database that you don't want to uh, launch every time a test runs, you just want to have the methods in order to store the data and retrieve the data later. So these are the five types of test doubles, and you can always use a mocking framework. As I said before, Mockido is usually the preferred one, is the one that I like the most. And you, if you're using Kotlin, as I do mostly for my Android apps, then I recommend you to use Mokito Kotlin, which is Mokito with Kotlin syntax and some enhancements. Uh, the part of dependency injection is complicated by itself, but what I would like to recommend you is to uh, figure out that you have to inject all the parts, all this, these test doubles, all, all these dependencies, uh, and if you want to do it properly, you have to follow more or less one of these methods. There are a few more, but these are the most typical ones. You have these methods in order to inject the things inside of your object. And usually you give preference to constructor injection, uh, then property, uh, a method argument, and overriding a method. But so in some situations, like when you are testing a view and you want to inject the presenter or the model view, you cannot use constructor injection just because you, you are not the one who invokes the constructor of a view, of a fragment or an activity in Android. Usually people use uh, Dagger2, Codein, Coin, or Toothpick, or any other dependency injection framework here, but the important thing is that you are able to uh, substitute the dependency that you are injecting. Six, uh, depression. And depression comes from the coverage. And I assume that all of you are developers, am I right? Any non-developer in the room? Okay, I'm going to tell you a secret that will may, may make you rich in the future. If you are going to be paid for coverage in a project, coverage is just a measure of uh, when any of your tests goes through one of the functions, but not of how well this test is implemented, of how meaningful it is. So if you are paid by coverage, you just create one test, you invoke all the methods, and you have 100% coverage. Totally useless, but still you will be paid. This is not our goal here. Our goal is to do it properly. So yes, you measure it, and you assign priorities to what is more relevant to you to be covered. And you agree upon rules within your team 
So everybody is giving priority to some parts of your code base in order to add unit tests to that. And it is not easy, but at least you can you have tools inside of the uh, Android Studio that will give you an estimation of the coverage. You can run the test instead of with the first one, the one that is highlighted here, that is logic test with coverage. And let me tell you that if you're using RoboElectric, at least for me, for 0.2 or from 4.0 onwards, it doesn't work. But uh, for the normal unit test, it does work and it helps a lot. Still, you have to tweak it because sometimes you have like, this is an example application, but you have the domain here and you see, oh, I only have 57%. How bad am I? So you click on that and you notice that this is in the use cases, 33% of the classes are unit tested, the other, so that means one of three out of three and only 60% of the methods. Oh, that's poor, isn't it? But then you come here and you realize that this is a use case factory that was created by Dagger. This is not your code. Should you test it? The answer is no. You shouldn't test any code that you haven't generated. So you are doing your job here. You have 100% of the classes tested here. So what happens on the other side when, when, when you have too many tests? Well. You can it, can, it can happen, trust me. Uh, you refactor in order to make sense of your code base, but also you modularize your code base. You separate into different modules in order to organize this so you don't have to run all the tests all the time. This is also helpful in order to reduce compiling times. So why not? I mean, the, the sooner the better. Uh, you have to organize your code, and if you have a good architecture, you will be able to do that. And you can even add some custom gradle tasks so you can decide for example don't run the at slow tests and then you can mark some of the tests as slow when you want finally we get to the seventh uh, stage and that is acceptance and hope and i hope that you are all there because if you have enjoyed this talk no test no fun and I believe that it is really useful for us to have uh, unit tests. If you want to evolve from here, well, I would recommend you to use a proper architecture that will help you to do this, and there are a few. Uh, you can use TDD also, so you will write the test before you write the code, and that's something that some people do, and I believe is the right way to go. Uh, you, unit tests are important, but there are some other tests that you can implement in your application and integration, UI acceptance, uh, sorry, UI acceptance, performance tests. This is also important. And if you already have some tests, why don't you do continuous integration and continuous uh, deployment? And that is uh, something that can be, well, it takes a while because it's a matter of process, more than tools. People think that having Jenkins running every night is continuous integration, and that's not the case. But if you want to go into that uh, path, which I recommend you to, uh, it can be done when you have some tests. At you, and uh, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, I will be more than glad to answer them. This is my Twitter handler, and thank you for being here.